Susan Gardner here for Municipal World. We're at the 2019 Fall Workshop for the Ontario Municipal Administrators Association. Joining me in the Municipal World Media Centre is FCM's CEO, Rock Carlton. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks so, for your, your interest in, in our stuff. So you are uh, you're here at OMAA uh, to do a presentation on uh, some research that... Uh, you recently did and, and a report they prepared, yep. Canada's Horizons. Yeah. So tell us about that. So we, in, we were in a process of doing strategic planning at FCM and we thought to ourselves, you know, we really need to think about where this country is going and what does that say about municipal challenges and what does that say about the needs for FCM as a, the FCM role in all of this going forward. So it was really a chance to think long term, think, think, create bold thoughts and then figure out what does that actually mean in reality and then start operating from that sense of reality towards this bold and imagined future. It's not a defined future, it's just an impression of what the possibilities and probabilities are like in the country over the next 20 years. So it's, yeah, the, the timeline is looking out to 2040 and um, some, some predictions about what we're going to be seeing, what the challenges are going to be. Yep. So what are the what are the the, the high level uh, well, pieces for this? You know, the, the research, first of all, we interviewed about 25 people, senior people in different sectors in the country. So we were just getting impressions of what people felt the pressures were going to be in the country. And, we, and you come to a few sort of ideas coalesce around a few key points. One is demographics and people and the, the aging population, the growing population of First Nations and Indigenous communities, the growing uh, immigrant community. Um, and what this means for the country. Um, so the demographic question is big. The second is, and related to demographics, but the second was that the country is, as we all know, it's urbanizing. The falsehood in this is that the sense is that it's urbanizing and rural Canada is dying. In fact, rural Canada is, is growing too. It's just growing at a different pace. And the pressures on rural Canada and urban Canada are different. Um, but this, this, the trend is to urbanization in bigger cities. The third area was the whole question of technology and energy and climate change and, and uh, what does all that mean for, uh, for the country and for municipal government in particular. And then the last one was governance. And you have a, you have a, we have a country that is increasingly urban where the cities and towns are on the front lines of most things that happen in this country and yet there's such small players in the governance framework of the country. So what does that tell us about how decisions get made and what the intergovernmental relationships might be like? And then ultimately for us, the role of FCM in, in all of those questions. So in, in looking at these uh, different areas, uh, were there things that you, I mean, obviously implied in all of that is um, a lot of uh, challenge, challenge for communities, challenge for municipalities. Um, were there opportunities that you saw in these things? For example, um, in the demographic changes that we're seeing. So the opportunities are all about the municipalities being on the front line and needing to think differently and do differently so they can take advantage of the opportunities. So, you know, we tell stories about the, um, the importance of the relationships between neighboring municipal governments and First Nations communities or Indigenous communities. And the, the, the changing demographics are such that the, first, the municipalities are going to need the collaboration and close cooperation of the First Nations to take advantage of the opportunities that are created by a, gro a great growing population base. Um, are, are, are we seeing uh, big improvements there, major strides being made in, in those collaborations between uh, municipal communities and other uh, First Nations neighbors. We are seeing progress. We're seeing progress. Yes, okay. I wouldn't say big strides okay. because it's in small pockets um, where um, First Nations or Indigenous communities and municipal governments the, it's sitting side by each are actually working collaboratively and they're developing cooperation agreements or friendship agreements in it. But it, that sounds kind of trite. They're really there are really interesting examples where they're getting into very serious 
joint work on economic development and um, other things where the work, the joint servicing agreements, for example, where they're sharing water resources or solid waste management functions, that sort of thing. So there are very, very practical uh, progress, things that are happening that are progress on the, the reconciliation agenda in small pockets, but in very tangible ways. So the, the municipal governments have this opportunity. Um, you think of, of the climate change agenda. I mean, 60% of greenhouse gas emissions in this country are under the direct or indirect control of municipal government. So with the right formula of resources and mandate, there's an opportunity there for municipal government to become a key player in the climate change agenda and reducing greenhouse gas emissions and supporting the alternative energy needs of the country. That uh, So municipalities have these huge challenges but they're great opportunities because they're on the front line and they can make such a huge difference community by community. So some of the challenges of course for, um, for municipalities in dealing with these opportunities, uh, challenges and opportunities yeah, of the future yeah. Um, are resource related and um, they're, they're resource related they're governance related so um, I mean municipalities are under resourced in this country we all know this this is part of our mandate at FCM to drive this agenda um, so there are resource challenges that are going to need to be addressed the second challenge is not in, in a priority order but the second challenge uh, that's really big is the governance question you know when you have a country that is really running on a constitution that is so out of date with reality that um, cities and towns just don't have the autonomy they need. So when you look at our work, we talk about the need for partnering with the federal and provincial governments. We talk about the need for fiscal tools that enable municipalities to do what they need to do um, in order to advance the, the interests of communities in this country. Um, so it's the the challenges are are resource. The challenges are governance frameworks, and you know then the challenges are just the need for the capacities. You know we we don't we have a lot of small towns in this country who don't necessarily have the capacity to do some of the work that they need to do. Not it's not they don't have the desire. It's not they don't yes. have the creativity. They just don't yeah. have the capacity. Yeah. Uh, and so taking advantage of, of immigrant settlement uh, policies that encourage immigrants to go to smaller towns, taking advantage of the, the indigenous community municipal relationship opportunities is what's going to be really important to support the strength of a local economy and to support the possibility of expanding local capacity. Um, in all of this, uh, you know, this uh, growing urbanization, globalization, um, there's important conversations to be had around um, economic development and local economies and yeah. all of that. Are there implications um, in some of these findings as well? Well, there are. I mean, we, we see over the years, we've seen just the impact of Walmart, for example, yeah. on, on medium-sized towns and, the, and gutting the downtown as they build in the, the perimeters. And I mean, that's not, that's, I don't mean that's going to continue. What I, what I mean is that there's going to be more and more online shopping. You know, 52% 50 of, of uh, purchases are done through Amazon. And so as that takes hold, the whole notion of a downtown and a small business community, in a community, the small business drivers of a community is going to be an, under threat. Um, so the economic development model is going to be, uh, it's going to be hard to sustain our, what is kind of our traditional economic, yeah. economic model in small towns in particular. And um, some of these, um, these other, these other economic opportunities, sharing economy, um, the kind of gig economy, are there opportunities uh, around technology? I mean, I think many communities hope that you know the the introduction of broadband and so on, um, if they can get it, if we can get that last mile built, yeah. this will help. Um, you know, provide some of the solutions for these communities because people will be able to really do the work anywhere no, that, that they want That's absolutely to. true. I mean, you know, if you look at some of the statements that are being made recently about um, our, our call for universal broadband, you know, the assumption is universal broadband translates into the need for r rural access, which is exactly right. But the people who are most vocal, or not most vocal, but who are supporting this agenda are the big city mayors. Because they're recognizing that for the cities to thrive, they need 
vibrant hinterlands. You need vibrant small communities so your economy is diverse and, and not concentrated in big, big cities. And so the accessibility question is huge. It's a huge economic driver for, for communities and a huge challenge. And we're really thankful that the federal government has committed to a rural broadband strategy and some resources. It's getting that last mile done and it's going to be key to making it both real and successful. Yeah. Because the truth is all Canadians don't have the same level of access, the same ability to you. I was in a car from Toronto to Collingwood this morning on a conference call and my line dropped twice. Yeah. And that's just, that's in southern Ontario. Yes. Yeah. I had the same experience on the way up here. Just yeah. dead zones. Yeah. So yeah. Um, important that we address that. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier the, the, um, the, the constitutional issues, the governance issues. What do you think? Is there a possibility that we're ever going to see that constitution opened up and have some sort of change made? around uh, communities and local governance? I don't think going the Constitution route is the right thing to do or the possible thing to do, because as soon as you open up the Constitution, you open up a whole dog's breakfast of other but issues. I'm of the, the opinion also, It'll never, it's never going to happen. No. So, no. so what's, the, what's the solution to this? Well, the point, the, the solution is to find mechanisms to work together that are not constitutional, they're not necessarily political. They're just ways of working together. So for example, um, it's not uncommon for the federal government to launch into a policy initiative, let's say, around, around uh, wastewater management. They, they legislate that there's going to be secondary wastewater treatment across the country as a minimum standard, all that stuff. So behind that policy stuff, those policy intentions, there's a lot of technical issues. And so it's not uncommon for us to, to come to the table with the feds um, and the provinces on the technical stuff so that we build the technical framework for a new policy that makes sense. So it's not it's not governance in the in the constitutional sense of the word, but it is about three orders of government sitting down together and sorting out what makes most sense. We do it in public transit, we've done it in a few files like that. So it's it's finding the opportunities to bring the three orders of government together to do practical collaboration to define what works best for the country. Forget about the Constitution. It, like it's, it, it's, it does come back to recognizing that one taxpayer and yeah, that we're kind yeah, of here. Yeah. So um, federal and provincial associations, um, political and administrative associations, uh, FCM, you know, obviously at the top of that list mm -hmm. on a national basis, have an important role to play in um, helping shape that dialogue yeah, and yeah. facilitate um, with the expertise and I mean, one of the, the obviously one of the great challenges is that the, the municipalities are the creature of the province quote unquote and yet the federal government has a huge role to play um, and has a huge impact on the cities and towns and so finding a way without um, being confrontational finding a way to bring the three orders together around national issues and national challenges will help line up at a provincial level what needs to be done it's hard what do you think 10 years from now, uh, what do you think we're going to be dealing with? What do you think the top issue is going to be? The top issue? It's a tough one. It'll, be, it'll be something related to climate change. Climate change. Yeah, and the impacts of climate change and the, and, uh, the um, adaptation work that's going to be required to uh, deal with disasters, to deal with the challenges that climate change is bringing both in terms of technology and in terms of uh, where people live and the quality of life and the, the kinds of things that, that uh, people do. And, and, uh, and I just, I think it's going to be a huge challenge because I think there's a huge inertia to doing what really needs to be done. Yeah, there's hard work to be done there. And yeah, and the other, the other thing is that when you look at these, the changes that are anticipated in this report, one of the impacts is, it, we imagine, is a change in the traditional revenue sources for government. So you imagine a scenario where work, the insecure kind of work and more individual consulting kinds of work become more common as the job scenario changes with uh, the various changes that are gonna come into society. The income tax revenues are gonna change. If you think of the, um, the inevitable emergence of the electric vehicle, yeah. And the decline in, in the, the uh, fuel, the fossil fuel based economy, um, the only, the transition is to electricity. 
So the federal government, which gets a huge significant tax bump from the gas, gas and the tax on fuel, yes, that's going to change. So their sources of revenue are going to diminish. The changes in the patterns of consumer of consumption and consumerism, and the, the growing emergence of Amazon and other online shopping venue, we, uh, mechanisms, and the inevitable therefore decline in the mall. I mean, we already see this. You know, in Ottawa, they're decommissioning malls and creating high-rise apartments. In Mississauga, they're they're running a whole exercise on rethinking the mall. So whatever those malls generate in terms of revenues for local or, lo or, or federal governments through GST or through property, you know, through taxes, um, it's all it's going to change. So where's the money going to come from? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> we don't have the answer to that question, but it's a question that we're going to have to come to grips with. Yeah. Because um, the financing of our, our, our just society is going to change in its makeup. And I can't anticipate what that change is going to be, but we're going to have to think about that. And uh, it's probably going to involve in incremental changes too, right? Uh, inevitably. We, yeah, um, it'll be bumpy and un uncertain and, and uh, there'll be tensions and stresses, but uh, it's going to happen. And uh, all these funding formulas that you know yeah. are working today, or maybe not ideally, they need changes, yeah. they're going to need adjustment and yeah. we're going to need to figure this out as we I mean, go. This is, this is one of the reasons why we push really hard for um, some version of, of the current gas tax model, which, by the way, is not based on gas sale of gasoline. It's just a transfer from the federal government, but the gas tax is a, a nomenclature where there's a transfer of right now it's about $2.2 billion a year from the federal government to the municipal system. And it's, it's such a way that, that you know, it's predictable, it's long-term, the municipalities can bank on it for longer-term loans, um, they can use it to their discretion based on their needs. That's the kind of fiscal room that municipalities need and the kind of autonomy municipalities need so that they can think longer-term, they can be innovative, they can think about public-private partnerships because the resources are there and predictable over the longer term. So that's the kind of thing that, like, where the federal government gets its resources, that's a different. That's a question that we'll have to yeah. sort out. But municipalities will um, would really benefit from some of that kind of stability and uh, yeah. predictable. I mean, right now the tax system, municipalities collect ten cents out of every tax dollar that you pay. So think of the services you get from your city or town, wherever you live, and ten cents. It's a great deal. Dollar. Yeah, it's a great deal. But what's happened to the other ninety? You know, I mean, it's there's just an imbalance in, in the fiscal framework in the country that is not going to not going to be advantageous as we go forward into this uncertain future and the pressures that are going to grow on municipal government. Uh, lots of food for thought there about yeah. uh, the future and things communities can kind of be doing to prepare for what's coming. Yeah, well, next. thanks for your interest. It's an important subject. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm Susan Gardner here for Municipal World with Brock Carlton from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. We share your stories. Music